Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2.15 p.m. session at HERE Startup Boston Week. So far, I hope you've seen a lot of great content. The last session in here was chock full of substance. And so if you were into AI or interested in that, I don't think you could have beat it. See some friendly faces out there in the audience. And as you know, this is a community of mostly volunteers, but then we have all these people, investors, startups, support people. This is the community of startups in Boston. And we're really glad that you're here. So our next session is another great one. Now, thank you, everyone. We're just doing musical chairs, don't mind us. We are looking at innovation at scale. So you've got your business off the ground and you need to keep it moving, keep innovating, keep changing, keep growing to compete. And I am very happy to once again introduce Rabe Majidi, who is going to lead the group. Thanks, everyone. Hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for coming back. If you have already been in another session prior to this. So um, this is the eighth years that the Startup Boston is having these events um, full of learning, networking. So welcome. Uh, my name is Rabe Majidi. I'm um, CEO and soon to be CTO of uh, Orthokinetic Drag. It's a medical device startup company located in uh, Massachusetts. I am a co-founder my myself, and this is also a very interesting topic for myself. Um, so um, basically, we were thinking about um, fostering a culture of innovation is vital for driving growth and staying competitive um, in a rapidly uh, evolving business landscape. And then we um, invited this experienced panelist uh, to help us um, understand to do and not to do while keeping the spirit of startups alive. So let's start with asking the panel to introduce themselves. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Beth Porter. Um, I'm from C10 Labs. That's an AI venture fund based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, started out of MIT in the Media Lab. And uh, we incubate and then invest in AI first, applied AI companies. We recruit uh, startups that are sectoral ex that come um, from sectoral expertise and really interested in helping drive AI innovation in all the sectors you can think of, which is, you know, that are affected by AI, which is pretty much all of them. So that's what we do. And I run the, the studio there. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Greg Lang. I'm the president and CEO of a company in Lebanon, New Hampshire called Simbex. We are a product design and development firm uh, and commercialization strategy. So we work with large companies and lots of early stage companies and walking them through the process of thinking about a product, developing that product, and getting that product onto the market. So that, that's our world. Prior to that, I was the CEO of another uh, medical device company for about uh, six, to, six to eight years. Uh, that was private equity funded. So I think both of those experiences will contribute to the panel. Wonderful. And um, I should disclose that Orthokinetic just started collaborating with Simbex, and, and these are a wonderful team. We have a great experience working with them. And thank you for the people from Simbex who are already in the room. Pleasure to meet you in person. Uh, Chandra Ramanathan, first, thanks for the opportunity to being uh, for being part of the panel. So I'm with uh, Danaher. It's a life science company, and within Danaher, I'm with a group called Life Science Innovations Group. So I focus on external innovation technologies that can bring new drugs to patients quicker, cheaper, and more efficiently. Thank you. So um, before we start with the question and learn about. Um, um, experience and insight of the panelists. Let's um, get to know audience in the room. So I know this is the latest stage track, but I just want to know how many founders and co-founders we have in the room. Awesome. How many investors we have in the room? Oh wow. Okay. How many? Um, I know a couple of faces. They they were just shy to raise their hands. So <laughs> how many? Um, uh, engineers we have in the room, people who are passionate about starting business. Awesome, great. So, okay, great. So um, we have pretty much diverse group. And then uh, how many people have raised beyond Series A? Awesome, we have 1%, 2%. Um, so 
Okay, so let's get started with the questions. So um, maybe I start with Greg. So um, how do you foster a culture of innovation in a growing company? Yeah, you, you know, at first I want to provide a little context, you know. So uh, like I look at this, there are two, two different parts of it. One is what's ongoing uh, work on the products that you're developing, and then there's the, the part of how do I bring in new ideas. Uh, but I'm a, I, I would focus here on you have a product in the market, you're trying to iterate, you know, like, and how do you keep that innovation cycle happening? There, there are a whole bunch of things that I think about, you know, for, first and foremost is not stopping talking to your clients. You know, so many of you that have gone through, thrown, gone through the process of customer discovery and you've understood what all those customers do and then all of a sudden you have a product in the market and you realize that that's not what they really wanted. Mm -hmm. You know, there are all these things that you're learning as the products, the products out there and you can't stop talking to them. And I think uh, you know one of the things that, that that I've seen over my career is is once you get into kind of that maintenance mode and not in the I'm still learning from my clients all the time, uh, it, it's really hard to kind of get out you know to to stay in that cycle of I'm solving problems for my clients, which is how many of you started the company. I'm solving a problem, but you have to stay in that mode. And I think uh, I think staying there is I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, staying in that that mode of customer discovery, always asking and being close to your customer, I, I think that that that's really huge. Um, the second thing I would say is making sure you're allocating time between maintenance, support. You know, like, like you're going to have clients that want things. You're going to have bugs in your product that you're going to be iterating on, and uh, you know what what I've seen is that your engineering team or your, the team that's maintaining the product. Where is the sense of urgency? The sense of urgency is generally on, I need to satisfy you, my customer, right now, because you have a problem. But it takes away all of that mind space for what are the new things that I want to build into my product to keep the innovation going? So a couple of thoughts. Awesome. Anything you want to add? Yeah. So uh, maybe uh, I can kind of bring a kind of a big company perspective, even though there are big companies, they're also trying to innovate. I'll give you like two concrete examples. I used to work for uh, a major uh, European-based pharmaceuticals. I've been there for more than 150 years. So they really thought through like uh, whatever got them for 150 years may not get them through for next 10 years or so. So they thought like how we can look at the innovation like a startup, like many of you out here. And it was like a blank slate. As we went through the process, we kind of like landed on four elements. I think that those four elements, depending upon the different settings, you can kind of like apply it. The first one we thought like, okay, we talk about innovation, innovation, and especially as Greg, what he pointed out, like having a culture, like a customer oriented. I mean, like what kind of culture you're having that really fosters innovation? So what is it go like? So we kind of talked about like a, how we can kind of uh, uh, foster the culture. Like as they say, like culture eats strategy for breakfast. So it's kind of like, a, how do you think about it? That's one. The second one, we also felt like uh, it's good to talk about like customers, the need and things like that. There should be a mechanism for you. You can go and make it happen. Okay. So we thought about like, okay, we have a customer need. How do you make it happen? Is there a channel we can kind of like go and get it? Okay. Either like the channel could be an having an investment arm or, or it could be an external innovation. So that's the second aspect. The third thing you want to do it is innovation, while it's very cool to talk about, there's a lot of failure. And a lot of people don't want to get the innovation. I see a lot of brave people out here in the seed, pre-series A stage. So the kind of thing, no, it's, it's a failure. In a, in a big company setting, failure is not really recognized. Yeah, so, uh, so we want to make sure that it protects them. And the third one is we need to talk about it. I think it's going to be, uh, it's not only like a, a, we perceive internally we want to foster innovation culture. We got a very good communication, both with audience like you outside, also Intel. So we kind of like worked with the four mechanisms which we, which we felt was able to kind of uh, scale or revive a cult uh, innovation culture within a big company. Yeah, I'd love to add something there. So um, I worked at a, a very large scale um, publishing company for six and a half years. And one of the things that we were you know, if you may know how publishing works, it usually works by accreting other 
imprints and then the publishing company has another set of books and electronic products to sell and that's how they work and so what ends up happening in a big company like that is that they all bring with them their platforms and then you're supposed to integrate them all very uh kind of gross <laughs> technical challenge not very efficient and you end up with a lot of um, different technology that all needs to be supported and that becomes a dreary sort of like soul deadening exercise that you have to carry out so while i was there uh, running uh higher ed uh, technology, we got the mandate to consolidate them all. And that probably is spinning a lot of wheels for you and like, oh my god, that sounds like a horrible exercise, and it was. But when we started to talk to all the engineers, the thing that was true about them is that they really did want to work on this problem. It wasn't that they felt that this was a problem that could marginalize them. Rather, they were find, trying to find ways to become involved. So we thought that we could kill two birds with one stone, which is that we could both do the consolidation that we wanted to do to make sure that everybody could be successful, that we met our goals as an organization, and we could enlist all of these very talented engineers from around the organization to be participants. And so we started an internal open source project where we held onto core in the middle, but then we welcomed all these other smart, capable people from around the organization to participate in an open source project within, within the publisher. And that allowed us to really help, you know, inspire a lot of very innovative, very creative thinking, not just about the integration challenge that was ahead of us, but also the, all the new things that we were thinking about building on the backs of each and every one of those sort of platforms that we had to now bring into the center. And that sort of the open source, I, did a lot of work with open source at open edX as well at edX. But that project, I think, was one of the better sort of examples of how to help yourself and help you know drive new ways of thinking about how to run a, run a business. And um, it was uh, you know reasonably successful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Oh, we have one question already. So um, wait for a mic for a second. It's people online. Yeah, they just need to hear you. Yeah. Hi. So I have two questions. One is, uh, in a big company, how do you maintain like a balance between research innovation versus maintaining status quo? That's one thing. Second one is, how do you instill a culture, or maybe you want to try some new culture, uh, change culture in an organization? How do you do that from a top level management to like the ground level, right? Yeah. Thank you. So uh, great questions, and I think uh, Rabe is actually has those questions part of the mm -hmm. panel, but I'm glad like bring it up. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, status quo is not an option. I think uh, the the external environment, the needs. For example, I work in a life science company. End of the day, it's patient needs. I worked in uh, cancer oncology, and uh, even though we made like excellent progress in many tumors. There are certain tumors like pancreatic cancer where someone gets diagnosed, most likely it's death. I think, so there is a, so it cannot stop. And I think the way the balance comes out is, you nicely made like a research and innovation. So I call it like a internal innovation and external innovation. So many companies actually, they compete. I think the culturally, how do you make it like, for example, if you have a customer problem, what is the best solution for you to get there? And there are situations where we had an internal product that is great, it will get there, let's say, in like five years. If I can get an external innovation uh, project which can get us in two years, how do you make an organization that can uh, embrace the external innovation and kill the internal one? I think uh, it goes back to your second question in terms of culture, uh, the way people are being incentivized. Mm -hmm. If your program doesn't go through first, uh, they don't get incentivized. So having culture that it doesn't matter where the program goes through, as long as the internal team brings in the external opportunity, takes it forward. So I think balancing between internal and external is going to be very important. End of the day, it's going to be like one research and development. And where do you source innovation? It's external or internal. And what, like Beth, you kind of talked about is like, a, even with an internal, how do you source like a, uh, we had like few programs within the company, uh, where you post challenges, maybe like someone from a totally a different department can think about a problem in a very different way than one, one could envision. So great questions. I hope kind of addressed, addressed them. Thank you. And then maybe you can comment more on how you balance between the process and um, um, freedom to operate, innovate. 
Yeah, I um, think I, I'll, I'll you want to go first. You, you go ahead. Okay. Um, so I think you know one of the things. So I mostly, even though I work in startups now and I've been a serial entrepreneur for the last several years, I mostly worked in big companies for almost twenty years. I worked in very large companies and tried to do internal innovation and and entrepreneurship as best I could. And the thing that we your point about incentives is super important. So I've seen internal innovation fail because just because of lack of incentives, not because it wasn't a good idea, not because it wasn't responsive to customer needs, not because it wasn't right the right thing to do from a product point of view, but if your employees are not incentivized to do innovation work or to step outside of the, the box of the work that needs to be delivered to make commercial progress, there's no way they're going to do it. They literally won't sign up. And so one of the things that we rolled out in my last um, startup, which ended up getting big enough to have these kinds of problems with about 125 people, is that we had actually hacks. Um, we didn't call them hackathons because that sounded long. Um, we called them hacks because we kept them to 24 hours. And the job there was to say, you get to do this during the work day. This is not something you do on the weekend. You're not making a pizza ordering app or some other garbage like that. These were hacks to do the actual work of the company because we got ossified in how to solve the problem. So we knew we had to jar ourselves and make sure that we could actually make some progress. So we sort of stepped outside of our normal jobs. We didn't put them into our Asana board. We didn't do anything. We just ran it like a hack because we knew that that was the way that we could um, get the incentives and the goals to come together um, so that everybody would actually work on it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you I'm know, assuming ChatGPT didn't exist, no, so people no, were. This is pre ChatGPT. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I struggle a little bit with the word incentive. I think, I think, you know, you're always thinking about how do you empower your employees to do the best work, right? Absolutely. You know, and so, so what you're, what, what I think, you know, we've, we've tried to do is, is provide what's the challenge the customer's presenting broadly. You know, and understand that that challenge, and then allow people the time to be able to come up with creative solutions. You know, and and not be pre as prescriptive. You know, and we've we've experimented with you know one keeping it broad, mm -hmm. and then letting letting the you know because what you find is you know like you're you're, you're a, a, a startup founder, and you've thought a lot about the, the the clients. You know what they need, or you feel confident that you know what they need. It's very easy for you to come into a room to, of your team and say, here's what we need to build. But probably the better approach, even if you, even if you, in your gut you know, it would be, here's the challenge we're trying to solve. Because I think if you leverage the power of your team, give them the ability to think creatively, they might actually come back with something that's a little bit more creative than what you came up with in the first place. So I think being broad about the incentive, the incentive is all about, mm. you know, about driving the passion. So, you know, like if you're in a team of technologists, you know, like I think a big part of that incentive is to be able to solve hard problems. Here's my hard problem. I'm putting it out on a silver platter. Now, now the next thing from a leadership perspective is give them the freedom to think about it. You know, so we've, you know, we, we, we do have hackathons every once in a while, uh, but we also provide what we call is like passion project time. And so that's internal, external, you know, similar to the Google, you know, Google time, you know, like, time where we, we know what the challenges are and let our team noodle on these things and then come back. Um, but the, the, the next step in that process is share with everybody else. Uh, because what, what I find that is most helpful is you might have thought about it and come up with something and this person has the next stage in that, that development and can ask questions and bring it out farther. So being a little bit more open about that and being allowing that creative creativity to happen, I, I find that that's been incredibly helpful for us. Great. Anything you want to add, Chandra? No, I think uh, they're nicely summarized. Great. So let's go to the next question. So what role um, does leadership play in sustaining um, innovation? Maybe, Greg? I'll, I'll, take, I'll take a quick stab at that one. <laughs> I, I mean, it, like, I think Chandra already, already uh, mentioned it. It's, you know, innovation takes risk, it requires risk taking, and you have to embrace the, yeah, it's a fail, what'd you learn? Now let's move on, let's go to the next thing, and you can't obsess about, yeah, we wasted a lot of time or we wasted a lot of energy on it. You're the, you're the founder of the company, you know that's, gonna, that's agonizing. Shoot, we, we wasted time, but the problem is that you don't, make, you don't make significant strides unless you allow that kind of risk taking to happen. So I think 
you know, building a culture around the ability to, to risk take uh, is one. And then the second thing that I would say is giving time. You know, and that, that's also like, how do you give them, give people the freedom to yeah. take the walk, mm. be in a team, have open-ended questions, you know, that, that's, you know, that, that's, that's critical time. Like, I, I think, you know, uh, you know it, it's very hard to see someone in your office leave for an hour and go walk around the block, you know, but, ha but you know, I, I know for, for many people that's thinking time, you know, and you're solving problems. So you have to be able to think about how, when are the best sol problems solved? I wouldn't recommending showers in, in every office, you know, <laughs> some people, that's where they do their best thinking, but, you know, like, uh, you know, encouraging encouraging times to do that is is important. <coughs> My boss okay. used to call that wall time. Mm -hmm. It just seems like they're just standing there wasting mm -hmm. time, looking at a wall, walk, whatever you want to call yeah. it. But it is particularly for difficult problems. And I think yeah. this is one of the things you're sort of pointing up is that leadership has to really allow people to have enough space to encounter very difficult problems. This is uh, this is not something that you can always do by brainstorming. It's not something you can always do by collaborating. You know, sometimes problems are just hard to solve and they require you to have capacity to do that. And uh, if we're all just wall to wall on meetings and there's no way to do it. So we, we used to, you know, that gift of time is actually massive. Mm -hmm. And that sometimes it can only come from the top. Right. If there are these blistering schedules and de deliverables and deadlines, that that's probably where the leadership has to come in and say, nope, we said we were going to use this time to do this innovation exercise or this hack or whatever. And by God, we're going to do it. <laughs> right. I think, uh, just to add on to it, like, I mean, completely agree that leadership is super critical for making innovation happen and also make it sustainable. Yeah. I think it's almost like a dynamic process. In the beginning of it, I talked about this, uh, the experience with this European pharmaceuticals. In the beginning, it was very important that top leaders, they need to do it, and people are looking and make sure they're comfortable doing things. But for something to be long-term sustainable, for it to really happen, what you said kind of resonated, you got to have a people that are uh, passionate people. How do you rally them around like a, the hard problem, customer problems, you want them to work around. I think somehow you got to have that, uh, starting from the top, but making sure the bottoms up, they drive the innovation for a long-term success, and the people, they feel comfortable, even if they make mistakes, they will be, eh, it's okay, eh? it's part of learning. Yeah, I, I guess um, if I want to share my experience regarding this, so um, leadership in different um, industries is different, they have their own culture, so I, I remember I was working for a company that they were wanted to um, kind of pushing the leaders and engineers to um, become innovative and then bring innovation to the company. And then we had some times that they were bringing us some small Legos and they were pushing us to build something out of those Legos. I shouldn't say that, but I hate it. And I was like, I'm my thinking way is very different. I will not be innovative if I make a, like a doing building. I always do this with my toddlers at home. So I know how to work with Legos. This is not the way of me. So um, I was thinking always that like there shouldn't be the right or right, wrong way to do it. Obviously, sh shower is not a good idea, but like it's just like in every space. Um, but like, yeah, so company, they should have like a, a specific culture of innovation and then just give freedom to operate and freedom to innovate in the company to their employees. Can, can I just add one thing that you said that's, uh, that really I want to pick up on? Um, we had a we worked in a math and engineering software, and we were really uh, we were really stagnating. It was really really slow going. We're now at that time we were a penny stock. It was really hard to motivate people to do anything other than just you know their own engineering work that they were inspired by that had nothing to do with the product. So we um, we did persona work mm. actually to change the mindset of the team because it really it's like everybody just sort of lost their way they didn't know who they were building anything for anymore they really did not this was really true stagnation and so we we created these two personas uh bill and richard and we did a bunch of work to figure out who those two people were and uh richard was uh or bill was sort of our workaday engineer who just you know spent most of his time doing fairly straightforward work um and then clocked out at five or six and went home and richard was our passionate engineer who wanted to get to nine digits of precision on his calculations and do all this um really fancy and that we had this big dialogue with him what we realized but what we were doing is we were building all of our features for richard 
<laughs> and we weren't bringing any features for Bill. And we had this complete you know, mismatch in what the market needed, what the customers mm. needed, what we were supposed to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And then literally thereafter, every single feature we built, they were like, well, who's this for? Is it for Bill or is it for Richard? And we had completely just a total cultural shift of why we were there, who we were building it for, what mattered. It just was a sea change in how we operated as an organization. We did a privatization management buyout of the company. Then we got bought by a big company and we were all very successful after that. I don't want to say it was just because of Bill and Richard, but it definitely had a big, big effect. Can I make one, one more comment on the leadership side? You know, the, the, the things that, you know, maybe, I can imagine for, for many of you early stage companies that, that you're trying to get things off the ground and what, what happened you know, for my previous company in the same shoes that you were is we all get focused on that, that tyranny of the urgent yeah. you know, and, and we're all trying to solve problems. We're all moving as fast as we can. And I think you know, back to this, this allowing adequate time to allow people to step back is you, know, like you can't reiterate that enough because that's the only way that 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 innovation culture happens you know i like we we had uh an engineer at my previous company that i would refer to as the fireman he loved that hat you know like and every time customer had a problem every day that he was solving something always solving solving the the urgent things of the day uh, the problem is that engineer was probably also capable of getting rid of all of those issues that happened on a daily basis if he actually would have been able to carve out time and and fix the ultimate problem as opposed to fixing the day-to-day -day things. And I think that you know that's part of the trap that we all get into, which is I'm going to solve this right now, you know, and take care of this problem because, you know, Bill just called or mm -hmm. Richard uh, or Richard just <laughs> called and said, like, hey, I can't log into the website. Oh shoot, we've got to get on that, figure that out, you know. And then the next thing is this, and we're we're solving those things without saying. Okay, bigger picture, these two people just cannot focus on those. Don't answer those questions. Lock them in a room. Mm -hmm. Do something else and let them go. So. Yep. We have a question down front here, too. Uh, and then while you're going over there, we have a question online. Okay. Uh, people are really enjoying everything you guys are saying. Uh, Greg, your point about giving people time has been echoed. And Tom Ward wanted to know if you've got any specific hacks you can share for driving innovation among the employees. So uh, one thing we used to do, like uh, we used to do hackathons, which is kind of combination of both internal and external. So the way we do it is we kind of like start uh, Friday evening, and people work till like Sunday afternoon. Yeah, so they take some break, something. It's a kind of uh, interesting combination of very good clarity on the problem, the problem you're trying to solve, plus selecting the right groups, plus good pizza and beer. Some of it happens like Sunday, you'll be very much surprised that there's some good solutions. Actually, yeah. uh, one from one or two hackathons, we did have like solution that went into new product development. So that is something like we really felt it like uh, uh, valuable in terms of taking a problem and pushing this uh, thing forward. That's one thing. The second one, what we did was, uh, is we used to have some mentorship programs. Like for example, there are people like in this, uh, how do you scale it? We kind of bring them within the four walls of the company. In a big company, it works because it has all these other features. So we basically ask them, like, uh, where do you see yourself from growing from today to six months, one year from now? Just tell us where you want to be. We'll make sure it happens. So uh, people found it to be very beneficial. So a couple of examples. I have, I have another example, if it's OK to add. Um, one of the kinds of ways you can do a hack that's not really a product hack, it's like a how do you know what problems to solve hack. So one of the things that we did was that we gave people the problem of trying to figure out what problems to solve. How do you engage your customer? How do you meet them in a different way? How do you hack that problem? Because sometimes you get really bogged down in the same old techniques for reaching your customer to learn from them. So we did a hack that was on how do you learn better from your customers? How do you engage them? How do you ask questions? How do you get them to give you the best information you can possibly get in order to then mm. do the follow on work? But the hack was great because we just completely upended how we talked to to customers, it was and fun. Excellent, I, I, thank I'll, you. I'll, I'll add one one short short hack. Um, 
you know, at, at our staff meeting, you know, so we're 40, 50 people, you know, so it's, it's one, one group meeting. Uh, and uh, we start off in our meeting as, as somebody uh, sharing the failure board for the last week. So <laughs> what didn't go well? You know, what did, and, and usually it's a, a share, share what misstep happened and how, how you figured it out and what you learn. Uh, and I think, you know, like making that totally open, you know, and, and transparent and people willing to say that, you know, like, it, you know, it, it touches on this culture of risk taking mm -hmm. uh, and it makes sure that it reinforces it's OK. And, yeah. you know, like I, I lead lead that meeting, but I don't, you know, like, but this is an open discussion. And I think that that's very effective in reinforcing the, you know, so small hack, but it's culture hack. Yeah. Absolutely. Three great ones. And so we have a question in the room. Yeah. Yes, um, good afternoon, super insightful uh, discussion. Thank you so very much. My name is Shazab, uh, I'm the founder for Forte Investment Fund. And my question is around management systems and governance, more from a limiting factor or inhibiting factors to driving uh, you know, and scaling uh, you know, with innovation, right? In your mm -hmm. corporations and companies. Um, how have you seen that play out and what are some of your aha moments? Mm -hmm. So, you're in the most regular yeah. table, so. So, uh, so when you do innovation, everything like end of the day, innovation, it has to succeed. It has to translate to impact. So for example, your funds like, um, um, you cannot just keep on giving money, you got to make sure there's an ROI and things like that. So what we found is governance can really help in fostering innovation. The way the governance can be is, uh, for example, uh, I'll, I'll give a very tangible example that we do a lot of partnerships. We have a governance that actually goes through the um, innovation path. And uh, we meet on a quarterly basis and ask ourselves, can we release the funding for next six months or next three months? Uh, we ask that question. And what we ask the governance is, don't be like just verbatim in terms of black and white, because when you start a scientific project, there are a lot of ups and downs, especially, I don't know how many of you are in life sciences, it's like a big challenge. Mm -hmm. The success rate with very, very early stage, it's less than 1%, yeah, 99% will fail, I mean, or be, been shown to fail. So I think the governance where people are willing to be flexible without just keep on like funding something that's not right. Eh? Uh, it, it's more of an art. We kind of encourage people that uh, you have a clear set of go, no go criteria, our projects are like, two to three year time frame, we have very, very clear go no criteria, all well said before you start the project. But you ask the governance to say to your point that, yes, even if it's a no go, uh, is it because the science is not working, totally feeling got to stop it? Or you know what, you learned something which made your go no go different. So that is a flexibility you want to go. So governance is a must, but governance should be flexible and ad adaptable to science. Can, can yeah. I? Oh, go ahead. You got it. You got it. Okay. Can I just ask you a question? When you when you're using the word governance, what do you what exactly what kind of governance do you mean? Because there's so many different types. <laughs> so <laughs> absolutely governance from a standpoint of how you govern go no go decisions, as well as governance from a standpoint of the management systems that actually surround right those decision making right. Yeah, yeah. Not so much governance from a standpoint of the different organizational structures, right? Yeah, but yeah, more yeah. kind of the processes that you have in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I think from that point of view, um, the governance of your decision making process is usually, uh, it's actually pretty black and white in a lot of sense, right, which is what you were talking about. But I think the way you enlist people in being part of governance does change its complexion quite a bit. So you can have an, in my opinion, you can have an absolute set of things that have to be met right um, even because sometimes they are like if you have to meet a cybersecurity standard that <laughs> there's no wishy washiness there well i mean there might be a little bit but but often it's a very you know hard list but how you enlist the organization to help you meet that set of governance standards i think is a lot of how we've been successful even meeting some very difficult com like compliance or you know policy rigid requirements coming to us from other customers that kind of thing and really keeping that itself as a challenge out to the organization to say you know we're going to be part of a go no go together this is not me declaring from on high we're not ready to go yet i think it's sort of like a bit like yeah. what you were saying mm -hmm. before which is enlisting your team in the decision making process is it good you can tell me you're the engineer is this going to cut 
you know, is this going to cut mustard or is it not? Yeah. And they know the answer to those questions. And as long as you don't make it a scary thing where they're going to get in trouble if they say mm -hmm. yes or no. Um, I think that that is, you know, how governance can be your friend because um, inviting others to be part of it is really critical. And um, you usually get there faster too. Yeah. I, I, so, yeah. no, please go ahead. I, I mean, we, we, we've implemented something like, like, like I think what you're talking about at our, our company, and that is, you know, there's, there's innovation internally, like thinking about products, and then there's innovation from a, what are the new products we want to develop, and we came up with, you know, our criteria. So I right. think, I think you know, what we're trying to get at is governance criteria, and I think this is, what are the criteria by which we would determine whether this new innovation is something that we want to pursue. Yeah. Uh, like I think I think having those criteria clearly articulated will help like what you're trying to do is just put guide guideposts around the innovation because you know you you might be in the medical device space and your uh, your engineer came up with a new rocket. It may not be the thing that you want to pursue, you know, so you need some kind of guideposts around it. Yeah. Just want to add this like I know this is a very diverse audience and maybe from a yeah. biopharma perspective is uh, in a biopharma, we don't kill things very often. Like, uh, we cannot let it go. It's very difficult to kill programs. See how much ever you talk about. So your question is governance is like spot on. So mm -hmm. you always say like, uh, fail fast, fail early. And I think having making sure that people are not painless for it because the cost of doing things like keeping it longer is huge. For example, a cardiovascular drug phase three could be like 200, 300 million dollars. Yeah, so you don't want to get there and fail very horribly. You may want to fail much, much early. So it's kind of like a, it's a, when you want to kill a lot of things in early, it's very important that uh, uh, it's easy to kill everything being innovative enough. And it's almost like an art eh? having the right governance people who can kind of like eh, give the necessary flexibility at the same time, they don't just let like program just randomly go through. Okay, so um, I know we already covered some grants from like question, next questions, um, but let's um, look into like kind of summarize this in the form of question. What are good organizational models that can help to foster the innovation based on like a uh, product development team perspective? So can you comment on that, Greg? Well, one, one, I mean, there, there are lots of ways to attack this question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it down to maybe the engineering a little bit, little bit more operational. Uh, is you know, we, we in my last two companies, we've used an agile product development method. Does anybody use agile in their product development? Yeah, lot, lots of you. And, and I think you know, like having that structure and the things that I find most valuable about that structure from an innovation perspective, is the sprint demo time when the teams get to share what they've worked on or problems that they've solved uh, because you know yes it's it's one opportunity to have people show the things that they're proud of but it's another opportunity to have this engineer go wow you really solved that problem in a very creative way like and i can take that over to the project i'm working on like i think you know it, it's a very you know it's, it's a simple framework but it allows for cross-pollination you know depending on the size of your team that I, that i have found incredibly uh, incredibly helpful for our teams. You know, in the last two companies that I've been, it has been been really effective. So one one small part of structure. I actually uh, found that a flatter organization was more helpful in a lot of sense um, to kind of foster just what you're talking about, mm -hmm. which is to not put too many layers between mm -hmm. you know the the top of the food chain, if you will, and the people who have to do the work for that for that person, and. Um, and to substitute instead an enormous amount of transparency. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, oh, transparency, it's so time consuming to do transparency well. And so, you know, we tried not to just make everything be on Slack or everything be something that has to be written in a, you know, Kanban or something like that, but actually to use live meetings a lot more. And again, counterintuitively, that does seem to be the better way to get information to be transferred, just like your demo, you know, mm -hmm. like you're there and everybody's putting a huge premium on trying to like sure that we can ratify or document or make sure it's all written down. But actually the live transfer of information in some cases, not all, ends up being a much more expeditious, much more fertile way to help um, continue to have people talk to each other and, and invent new um, new things together. And we really relied on that a lot, even in a totally virtual uh, teams. I think uh, just to add a big organization perspective, in multiple organizations I've seen, an innovation group is being formed to kind of like enable that. I think uh, it's almost a success depends upon 
how soon the innovation group can do the thing, whatever the cultural framework, governance, et cetera, and disseminate that to the rest of the organization and dissolve by itself. Yeah. So it has to be, as you said, like uh, innovation has to be organic. People should, everyone should innovate. Yeah? You don't need someone else to tell you a separate group claiming ownership, but you need a, in a bigger organization with so much inertia, there is a role a central organization can play, but they should do the role and make sure that rest of the organization uh, embraces it quickly. Yeah. So, uh, Beth, do you think that new personnel or a mindset shift is needed for like um, more established companies? I think it's very organizationally dependent. So I've definitely worked in companies where we needed somebody to come in from the outside and really shake us because we couldn't we couldn't really do it by ourselves. So we had um, a consultant. It was just somebody that we knew come in and um, help us realize how many assets we had and that we were able to do this ourselves and not so much to tell us what to do, but to you know teach us how to continue to be good um, learners and you know able to use that learning to grow. So that was a money well spent to have somebody come in and do that. In other organizations, I think you are, um, often you're trying to put a lot of, when you, when you grow and you start to get big, you're trying to put some restriction and some you know uh, governance on top of what you're doing. And that ends up being the thing that dampens you. And you still have very innovative, very excited, very passionate people in the organization, but unwittingly you've put structure on top of them in a way that then uh, destroys it. So I think that it can both can work depending on the nature of the organization and I've seen it be successful um, to have people come in from the outside and just give a little bit of a shake of the tree to get people going again, definitely. Question you have a question? Okay, okay. sure. I'm, I'm Vinayak from Resumex and I have seen that the money spent on innovation and the value that you get out of an innovation are not always in proportion. Yeah. At times, something that is costing less uh, value, delivers a lot higher value than something where a lot of money is spent and doesn't deliver value. How often do you review projects to compare which baby is prettier <laughs> and how do you decide who decides and how do you account for it? How do you measure it? Well, you really kind of yeah. answered this question to some I degree. I go through yeah. this every day. Yeah, yeah so, you're just, this is yours. <laughs> so there are like a, two basic, I'm going to give you like more from a life science example, also a biopharma example. Now pure from a life science example, whenever we bring an innovation idea into the to picture, we go through all the things around like a, how much will be the return of ROIC, written on the invested capital, everything. And I think that people make the decision around, uh, if I have a limited pot, I have a limited pot of money, uh, shall I rather like put the money in an ongoing project or something I need to go and uh, go for an innovation? It sometimes it can, it kind of boils down to a simple math that uh, you go for an external one because the ROIC is more, or sometimes the internal one is less riskier. We can do it, it kind of boils down to that. So that is one way of looking at it. And many times where innovation plays a role is, there are things we know that it's going to disrupt the market space. And we don't want someone else to disrupt us and let us know, eh? and we get caught into it. So there are areas where we invest, and but we want to make sure that um, water we invest, it's very, very clear on the customer value. So those things are willing to take risk in terms of like, eh? because of the future product, protecting the franchise, we want to do it. But nonetheless, uh, whatever we do, it's kind of very much financially driven. Yeah? We want to make sure that, eh? I ask like three simple questions for all my projects. Eh? Is it a high value customer problem to solve? It should be yes. Second is, can I do this internally for whatever I have? Uh, the answer should be no. If uh, I'm looking at internal external innovation and I find out like a, who can solve the problem. Third thing important is, if I use a particular person's like a company or an academic institution technology and solve the problem, will it lead to a productization in a two to three year time frame? Okay, if the answer is not uh, uh, clear, then we don't go forward. And of course, once you sell the product, we want to make sure that uh, there's a commercial value associated with the product. That's from a life sense perspective. In a biopharma, uh, when I was there for like more than a decade, uh, every quarter, I have to go in front of management and say that, look at the entire pipeline of the company, how many of the assets actually coming from external innovation? I was responsible for it. It's a very, very important number because otherwise I don't get funding for next year.
We've got another question online. Uh, Curtis Giberson wants to know the UX team. So when it comes to user experience, do they have any role in innovation at your company? I mean, a huge role, actually, I would say. I mean, even, so the hack, the hack that we were talking about before where we were trying to figure out how to interact with um, customers in a different way, which was not directly the same as building a product for them, it was mostly UI and UX, right? We were trying to come up with a new experience um, in order to be able to learn. And I would argue that they're probably one of the most important people who can uh, really help you think about your products or the ways that you support your customers or whatever you're doing in a more innovative way because their job, their whole job, is to think about the end user and the experience that you want to offer to them. And that is typically, not always, but typically the place where you're going to be you know, the tip of the spear for the rest of your, you know, innovation activities, at least in my opinion, I don't. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think all of our job in the room is to have, you know, the people in the room that <laughs> yeah. know the best or know, know how to solve the customer's uh, challenge. You know, so, you know, all, all aspects are, are open on that one. Uh, awesome. Ditto, yeah, we cannot move any project without having the customer input. Mm -hmm. So that, that UX team is very important in the innovation process for everybody. Yeah, and not to be confused with UI, I, we always put them together, but the user experience or the customer experience or just the experience, I mean, that's, that's a holistic exercise. UI is a tiny piece of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. I was actually had a, a similar frame, a comment, just to hear your feedback as well, but um, I had a lot of it, success with uh, motivation for the engineering team by really involving the customer success team, that post-sales technical That's team that idea. was internal mm -hmm. and could speak with you know, blatant honesty about <laughs> all the very sometimes angry feedback you get on the calls from the customer uh, that they sometimes turn off with executives. I found that as well. Customers are really honest with the you know, feet on the ground, but you get an exec on the call to check in and they're like, oh, everything's great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, found a lot of success with having the customer success teams um, forward feedback when a feature is really helpful or having a customer success engineer demo the product and kind of say, you know, hey, this is a spot where customers have had issues or this is a spot. And that sort of internal feedback loop I have found really helpful. I just didn't know if you guys had any experiences or comments on that. Well, I, I would go back to my fireman example uh, earlier, you know, that, like, the the closer you know the 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 closer the that ultimate developer is to to hearing what the client really wants mm -hmm. you know the better the better off you are you know and, and so i think you know like as you're thinking about organizing you know the organization of your entity you know it's really great to have the software team you know halfway around the world you know because they're inexpensive and they can get the job done quickly and you know and uh, and there are plenty of attributes to that but are they hearing what we really want the customer really wants like you know, and you know, I think there's always. You know, I'm an advocate for a really good product manager, somebody that can bridge the gap. But you know, that takes you so far, and you really need somebody. You know, you you need to incorporate people into what's the real problem. And I think that's that's an organization question. It's a leadership question. It's a communication question. Yeah, we put customer success in in product, <laughs> for that reason, mm -hmm. really, which was to say, look, there's a translation that happens when you get it into the product manager's hand because they want to mold it into the product that you want. But something about listening to the customer complain directly <laughs> is uh, very formative to the engineers thinking about how to solve the problem. Not what the problem is, but how to solve it. And you can get that from a customer interact, a direct customer interaction. I think the downside or the, you know, the flip side of that can be the engineer takes it to heart and then they go back to their office and they try to solve that problem directly themselves without coordination. <laughs> and that can be a problem too. Yeah, guardrails, Yeah, guardrails. <laughs> Got a question over here. Hello. 
Uh, first of all, thank you so much for such an impactful conversation. My name is Erika Rivera, um, the co-founder of Monarch Coaching, a leadership development company who focus on uh, helping companies on f fostering innovative, uh, inclusive, and positive environment. So my question for you all is, what are three essential skills that leaders should uh, work on to keep the the setup is, is spirit alive. What do you think are those essential skills? I know we have a lot of different skills that leaders should work on, but those, what are those essential ones? We could each give one. All right, I'll give the first one. Yes. I'll pass it on to my colleagues. So I think the, the most important, from my point of view, is um, the ability to be firm in the goals um, as a leader and making sure that you, know, you are really transparent with all everybody who works in your entire company about why you're meeting those goals, why they are important, uh, what they are motivated by, how they get you to the next, you know, sort of plateau or milestone, or but um, but being very forgiving and um, allowing people to come to you and say, I didn't meet that goal, or I decided to work on something else, or I um, made a choice that was part of how I operate as an autonomous person in the organization, and, and welcome that input so that the leadership knows that even if they're really clear and really transparent about what needs to be done, there's still room for flexibility, expression, you know, new kinds of activities to happen, and then welcoming people to come and say, I did a thing. I want to tell you about it. It may not be the thing we have to keep working on, but I didn't want it to go by without being at least considered. So I've gotten a lot of mileage out of that. Very yeah. great point. Um, so um, we only have a um, few minutes left. Let me ask. You guys want to give oh, two oh their, I'm sorry. Each go, one ahead. Give one. go ahead. No, we want to keep going? Or no? Yeah. Uh, well, so, all right, I'll, I'll go. Uh, uh, so so I, I think that the, the responsibility of a, a, a leader is to, uh, you know, uh, like Beth said, clear goals. Like we know, we need to know what we, we're doing. You know, uh, and to find the right balance between here's the goal, here are the parameters by which we want to work, um, and allowing uh, the person to solve the problem and feel empowered in solving that problem. You know, if if you're a leader that is saying task A, you know, is it red or yellow? Red, yes. You know, like. That's not going to empower your staff. Like you have to find the balance between giving direction and allowing empowerment. I think that's the key. Yeah. I think uh, nicely summarized. I think if you want to look from a pure innovation angle, I would kind of uh, give a lot of weightage to the adaptability, agile kind of a thinking. So sometimes you want the innovation leaders. Steve Jobs example. How do you think about like a, a iPhone even before people know eh, the concept existed? Awesome. So, yeah. Sorry, I interrupted. So, um, so, uh, so let me ask this question from um, uh, Tana based on his experience. So, are there ecosystem partners that can serve as catalysts in the scaling process? Uh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. First of all, already you are in a tough journey. You don't have to go through it alone. I want to give like two examples from the ecosystem. There are plenty around. One is, uh, uh, I'm part of, uh, I work closely with Mass Bio and uh, their program called Mass Bio Drive, mostly for the people in this stage, like a pre-seed type of a stage. They, you can uh, apply for the Mass Bio Drive, can go through an eight week process and they, it really, uh, they help you like how, how they can scale the company so they can pitch to a broader set of, uh, broad, broader set of investors, so that is one. The second one is a group called Nucleate. Nucleate is very much it's a student-run organization. Uh, right now, uh, they have formed around like 400 teams around ideas. Out of them, 100 have been incorporated, and they raised close to like $380 million. Very successful. They pretty much give you the kind of the framework of innovation, what you need to do to succeed. Its website is nucleate.xyz. If you uh, Google do that, but there are a lot of opportunities in this ecosystem. In a way, you got to be lucky to be in Boston. Yeah? So where they're all like, uh, if you're an innovator, please tap into Mass Bio, Nucleate, there's Mass Challenge, Lab Central, so many out there. Please go and leverage them as efficiently as possible. Do you have anything at Simbex? 
you know, well, uh, you know, I, I helped found something in northern New England called the MedTech Collaborative uh, with the same intent, mm. uh, which is to bring in early stage innovators together to help them connect with people that can that can you know raise the boats. Uh, and so, you know, do, doing doing similar things. I think that it's really important to show up at those events, meet people, uh, and and understand who's in your community, uh, because uh, like I, I feel like. Yeah, you can't do it alone. You know, there are always things that you don't know, uh, and finding your network of people that can answer your problem and answer your questions quickly uh, is is really important. On the totally practical end of the spectrum, I think uh, right now there is a lot of activity and very fast moving activity around generative AI and uh, trying to learn those skills quickly can be. Yeah, you can make a certain amount of progress by yourself for sure, but there are some organizations that are really trying to help um, bring communities of people together to make sure that you can learn it together and with purpose so that you're not just sort of noodling on something by yourself, but you have a, a goal or a, a challenge ahead of you mm. to work on. So there's a, great, there's a great hacking club over at MIT called the Sunday Club, S-U-N-D-A-I dot club and they actually run hackathons every weekend where they have become and are continuing to be the experts in all those tools that are out there in the morass of them and then you come and you say well i've got a cool problem to solve you want to do that this weekend and then they'll they'll help you solve it and it's just sort of a a fun easy way to get involved in that community and learn something Right, right away, I mean, you really come away with knowledge and you've solved an actual problem with a group of experts. And so that's just one example, but a, a great fun um, a way to learn um, that particular emergent set of technologies um, with others. Great. So I didn't know about that. <laughs> so um, uh, just um, we want to um, leave it open for more questions. So um, if you want to give the one advice to the latest stage companies, established companies that they have ongoing projects and about the bringing the culture of innovation to their company. So what would that be? Technology couldn't be moving faster. you got to pay attention. There's so much happening all the time. So events like this, staying in touch with the startup ecosystem, going to open events, no, you know, not everything having to do with startups is open, but lots of them are. Um, we host events out of C10 just so we can meet you <laughs> because we know that the, it goes the other way as well. So it's, um, it's really kind of a, it's a two way street. Right? We wanna meet people who are trying to innovate within their larger, you know, later stage companies. And, um, you know, obviously the larger later stage company wanna meet startups too. So go to things. Yeah. I, 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 just a couple of things. One, one is, uh, you know, not, not just for yourselves, but for your staff. Yeah, you know, definitely. allow them to get out into the world and understand what's going on around them because they're going to bring back back better ideas. I think that that that's really important. I, I think the other the other thing is, you know, like I said in the very beginning, don't stop listening to your customers, even when you're down in the weeds of I'm solving the problems of my current product. Uh, I keep asking for feedback. It's going to, it's going to allow you to change. I think similar to the being open around the technology that's happening in the world, you know. Listen to your customers. You know, you'd be surprised what they really want. Yep. I think uh, just to, uh, two things. One is customer centricity, as you pointed out. And especially if you're going for life, life sciences problem, it's not only customer centricity of today. If you are in a drug discovery program, you got to think about like what will the customer need five to 10 years from now, which is a challenging thing. So I think that's important. The second one is community. Please leverage the community, the examples given here, because there's so much resources out there, especially for people in this ecosystem. They can really help you accelerate, accelerate your ideas to the next stage. Thank you. Thank you. And any more questions? We've got one way in the back there. This is probably the last question. Hi, this is for Beth. Uh, I'm Chris, a marketing go-to-market person at for various SaaS companies. When you're looking at this deluge of AI companies, mm -hmm. how do you hedge and filter for the next one that could simply come in and replace it with the next level LLM? LLM, meaning like, I'm sort of formulating the question as we go, but how do you know what you're investing in isn't going to be disrupted in four weeks? <laughs> yeah, we don't know anything that we can't know, obviously. Yeah. But, <laughs> but we, what we really... 
Yeah, there's a definite hedge for that. I mean, I think it comes back to actually what these guys were just talking about, which is that if it's focused on the problem and it's focused on the customer need and it's focused on, you know, actually correctly identifying not some cool tech or some cool way of solving the problem, but actually the problem itself, right, then that gives us the confidence that if they're solving a real problem, an actual real problem, not something trivial, Okay, we can just set aside that we didn't know we needed iPhones many years ago. But the, you know, besides problems like that, and this is why we look at uh, sectoral experts in C10 specifically, because we really know that those people know what the problems are to solve, even if they don't necessarily know how to solve them. So that's where, that's our North Star is trying to find the people who like, look, I've been struggling with this problem for 10 years and no amount of technology so far has helped me address it. How can we bring smart, smartest, you know, square mile in, uh, on the East Coast, how can we bring all those people to bear and try to solve that problem and be really, really focused on that and, and not distracted by all the other, you know, the stuff that's out there that seems uh, flashy and is, a lot of it is very useful, but you can get, um, get waylaid by it if you're not focused, uh, really focused on the problem. Great answer. <laughs> yes, and that's the billion dollar question, right? Yeah. So excellent uh, session, everybody. Great questions in the audience and online. Uh, if you want to have one last comment, we are now moving on to the next session, which is going to be for this same people in the room. It's going to be if you're already a little bit farther along with your company, how do you get bridge funding for your uh, startup before an IPO? How do you get, what is the question? How do you get bridge funding for a startup? Well, that's the next session, oh, so you don't have to worry about it. Keep going. <laughs>